IB Nation, welcome back to the Irish Breakdown Podcast live here on a Friday for Notre Dame Recruiting Hour. This is a big one. Ryan Roberts, Director of Recruiting here at IrishBreakdown.com, joined as always by Mr. Sean Davis, who is a recruiting analyst here at IrishBreakdown.com, as well as the co-host of the Lucky Lefty Podcast. You can find that on any and all of your favorite podcast platforms. Sean, we have a really busy one, man, because for people that have been living under a rock, Sunday is St. Patrick's Day, which means in Notre Dame land, that is not just about drinking and having a good time. That's about offers going out to the 2026 recruiting class, a part of the annual Pot of Gold offer event that was started four years ago. And we'll talk about a little bit of the history of the Pot of Gold. We'll talk about the importance, the relevance. We'll also talk about what the 2026 board looks like today before the Pot of Gold even kicks off. Some things you should expect some numbers, some interesting details that we can't disclose names to y'all, but we could talk a little bit about some numbers and some areas of strength that we see in the 2026 class early on. Sean Davis, though, before we start, man, how's everything going? Hey, everything is good, Double R. Good to be back on with you. It's been about, what, three weeks? I know, man. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, it's I been a while. I, I hope everything is going well in your land right now, my friend. I know it's uh, been a little bit of a tough one, but I hope everything's hey. good. You know, it's always dark, but the sun comes out every morning, right? You know, it is what it is, but I feel great, man. Notre Dame football, we have what? Big weekend this weekend with recruits. Next weekend, the yeah, pro man. day, another practice. And then right after that, we lead into what? The blue and gold game. So I mean, it's, a lot yes, to feel, it's a lot to feel good about as an Irish fan right now. And there's a lot that's going to be coming up at irishbreakdown.com because like Sean said, not only do we have spring more spring practice on the horizon, not only do we have the Notre Dame Pro Day for the 2024 NFL Draft on the horizon, not only do we have a busy m- month of March for recruiting visits, but then we lead right into April, Sean, which is going to be a huge month in recruiting for uh-huh. Notre Dame, getting a lot of official, uh, unofficial visitors and some officials at that point, but more than that will happen in June. So we're rocking and rolling here, folks. We're going to get into a lot of topics here today. A quick side note as far as a little bit of movement from shows. Usually the Monday show is our Monday uh, Monday mailbag where you guys bring in a lot of great questions. That is moved until next Friday because, Sean, Sunday, Pot of Gold, Monday, we'll be right back with the recruiting hour to talk about the players that were offered because it's a lot. It's going to be – guys, if you're on the boards of boards.com, Get ready for the flurry that is going to happen on Sunday because we are expecting a massive number of offers. But, Sean, I want to start before we get into some of the areas that I think are going to be key for Notre Dame in 2025, before we get into just some of the relevance of the pot of gold in general, some of the past Mm -hmm. wins of the pot of gold as far as early offers. We'll get into every part of the positions in 2026 that we have high expectations for early on but i want to start out by just for people that haven't been following along there have been several players already offered in 2026 so how this kind of works folks just so you know is that players are obviously some players are offered before the pot of gold some players you wait to the part of gold we'll talk about offensive lines one specifically where usually offers start on the pot of gold but we have some early offers that we just kind of wanted to put out there and show you what the board looks like right now, because 2026 has already been kicked off and we'll, we're going to start offense here, John, let's, let's get talking about some of these early offers and then we'll get into the 2026 pot of gold version. But as of today, the offense is off to a pretty fast start. We have seven quarterbacks that have been offered in 2026, a running back, you have six wide receivers and you have an offensive lineman. So no tight ends have been offered in 2026, only one running back. Only one offensive lineman. Obviously, the offensive line number will go up by by several (laughs) going into Sunday. But, Sean, we have a – I kind of want to start the conversation off with quarterbacks for a second because there are going to be some people that are going to ask, and it's a very understandable question, are we going to see the quarterback board expand in 2026? And the answer is very unlikely. Okay, very unlikely because, Sean – Not only do they have seven offers out already, they're in a pretty good position with several of these guys. So we've talked in nauseam on this channel about how we like where Notre Dame is with Ryder Lyons, how Mm -hmm. they have early momentum with Brady Smigel, how they have early momentum with Brady Hart. Noah Grubbs is coming back for a visit this offseason as well for his third time. So 
quarterback board for Notre Dame in 2026 off to a very fast start, to say the least. Fast start and wonderful quality. Now this We talked about this, Double R. This might be one of the most impressive classes of quarterbacks that we've seen in the last 10 years. Just from a prep standpoint, of just overall, if we look at it from floor and the floors of these young men and then the ceiling, you know, a lot of times you look in classes and you say, well, this guy has a high floor and then, you know, this guy has a high ceiling. and that. It's some really high floors in this class at the quarterback position. Different styles. Yes. You know, different styles in the guys that Notre Dame has, has tapped in this class based upon mm-hmm. what you put up there. But there's no way you would be mad with whoever comes out of that pack. Right. Man, whoever Notre Dame lands on and gets in the 26th class, there is no feeling of, oh, man, I wish we had gotten this other guy. I mean, you might have a preference, but you're not going to sit up there and say, oh, man, what? Why, why did we take him? No, this is, this is one of those, if you mess this up as the quarterback evaluator, then, man, you might want to rethink what you're doing. Right. It, it's a great way to put it, Sean, because I was talking about the 2025 class. Um, I was thinking back to it last year. I remember that Notre Dame had was obviously had offered several big time guys in 2025. At that point, it was like obviously Deuce Knight, but it was George McIntyre. It was guys like Antoine Hill. It was uh, KJ Lacey out of Alabama. Like it was a great board, but there were still Sean and like there were still for me, at least a couple guys on that board where I was just like, all right, he's pretty solid. Play. Like, hold due respect. I'm not going to throw shade to K because he actually ended up, he actually ended up reclassifying the 2024. But like, if Notre Dame would have got Cutter Bowley in the 2025 class, I wouldn't have been so jazzed, right? Like, I wouldn't have been like, oh man, Cutter Bowley. Like, I wouldn't have been like just crazy excited about it. But I think you make a great point of like, if Notre Dame ended up with Ryder Lions, I would be ecstatic. If they ended up mm-hmm. with Noah Grubbs, I would be very, very happy. If they ended up with Brady Hart, I'd be happy. If they ended up with Brady Smigel, I'd be happy. Troy Hune even is a kid that I know you like a lot out of California as well, who's the most recent quarterback offer. So, And if they somehow ended up with Jared Curtis, which isn't going to happen, I would be like through the through the roof happy, you know, almost at the moon as far as the happiness is going to levitate me a little bit. So quarterback class is incredible in 2026 it really is and i don't like to get super hyperbolic with kids that have only finished up their sophomore year but i watched jared curtis throw the ball about four times and i was like okay i I, I don't i don't need to see anymore i i I legitimately don't need to see anymore he's very first of all six four two twenty as a side that that's absolutely insane and he's very if you watch the way he drops back the way he runs, the way he holds the ball on the run, he's very reminiscent of Ben Roethlisberger. If you just yeah. watch him, he, and then the way he moves and just like shoves people off, it's like this kid is a sophomore and he's like making everybody else on the field look like minions. It is, yeah. he might not be as polished. This once again, it goes back, goes back to what I said. Like you look at other guys like a Noah Grubbs or a Ryder Lyons or a Brady Schmeagle or a Brady Hart, Troy Hume, who I like. Yep. All of these guys have their different areas where you feel like, yo, this is what makes him special. Yep. But everyone fits what Notre Dame is trying to do. You know why? Let me tell you why. I'm going to go ahead and just read what you have on the screen here. 6'3", 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", 6'4", 6'2", 6'4". The days of 5'10", 5'11", 6 feet in the Notre Dame quarterback room seem to be over, Ryan. See, that's, oh, it's over, Sean. No, it's those over. days seem to be over. over. <laughs> Let's go find talented six, three, six, four quarterbacks that actually exist. I didn't, we didn't know those quarterbacks existed for a while at Notre Dame. And now, you know, this coaching staff is showing us, yeah, you can go find big, talented, big arm quarterbacks with different talents. But I am super excited to see how this plays out. I really am. And I'm, my wonder is, is there a time crunch now? Like, are these young men, if they are truly interested in Notre Dame, is there a time crunch on them and how they evaluate the Notre Dame situation, knowing, hey, if I'm ready to go, I might need, I might have to tell them, yo, I'm ready to commit. Like, does a kid show up at Blue and Gold game and say, you know what, 
I'm ready to be the quarterback in this class. It's going to be very interesting well, to see. Yeah. Well, I, I so a crazy note that kind of just kind of emphasizes the one thing you said, Sean, about and because you made two very important points that I want to hit on both. One, you mentioned the height. We have some verified measurables on that group. And the shortest player, because sometimes guys are listed at 6'2", but like they're actually six foot, right? Like we don't trust the number. Ryder Lyons is the shortest player on that list, and he is a legit 6'2". Like he's been measured at a camp at six foot two. So the shortest guy that you're looking at is a six foot two quarterback. We have seen Noah Grubbs, a legit six foot four. Brady Hart, yeah. six four plus. Brady Sme- Smigel, six four plus. Uh, th- these guys are tall dudes, man. Like they ha- are getting some taller quarterbacks to definitely strengthen the room. There's no doubt about it. And I would also say this too, Sean, because you, know, you mentioned this, there is going to be competition for this spot because Notre Dame right now is in a good spot with, I would say Ryder Lions, Noah Grubbs, Brady Hart, Brady S- Smigel to a degree. And then Troy Hune is, is obviously the newer guy on the board, but Notre Dame's in a good spot with several of these quarterbacks I don't know if you saw this, but I had an interview with Noah Grubbs where we talked a little bit about the visit and just kind of a recruiting update type of thing. And he mentioned that one guy that is 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 a part of the potential spot in the class is Brady Hart, who he actually trains with down in Florida, like literally trains there. And he said, it's going to be interesting to see how that all figures itself out type of thing. And I'm like, that's interesting, man. So they know that there's like, although Notre Dame, loves Ryder Lions and love Noah Grubbs. They know that there is competition for this spot, man. This has become a much more attractive spot is kind of what I'm going at, right? Mm. Mike Denbrock, Gino Gadouli being able to sell the vision and then obviously having Mike Denbrock as the case study of like, look what he's done offensively. I would say just overall, this is a quarterback position, a quarterback number in a class that is becoming more and more attractive than maybe what we've seen in the past for Notre Dame. Yeah, you have to look. They're talking about it in the chat, like the background of the quarterback room. Mike Denbrock, the last time they had a comp comparable quarterback room as far as far as that talent, it was when Mike Denbrock was here. You know, and he was working and developing those quarterbacks. So you're right, the position with Geno and the way look, the perfect uh poster child could be recruiting, but could also be the development of Steve Angeli. And yeah. what we saw in the spring and what we ended up seeing in the Sun Bowl. Yep. Like, yo, look, this is the development path here at Notre Dame at the quarterback position, which was something that a lot of people have been crying about for a decade, talking about the regression of the quarterback position at Notre Dame had been the yep. narrative. Yep. Now it seems like in a two-year span, that narrative has changed, which has led, led to increased interest on the recruiting trail. And it's led to the prospects in the 26 class now where you're looking at, what, seven guys that now are fighting for one spot. And I say that in all honesty. Yeah, you're fighting for a spot. It's it's different than other schools where schools are, like, in a position to have to beg someone to come. It's like Notre Dame is at a spot now where they're like, look, I'm sure they have their pecking order. But like we said, all of these young men are very aware that yo time is of the essence and more than likely Notre Dame is going to want the leader of that 26 class in place by this summer they're going to want that they're going to want that guy going into the fall being the head of the class being one of the main recruiters and being the face of the recruiting class Mm -hmm. so it's going to bear watching to see how it plays out because it is absolutely one of the best positions that the coaching staff has been in with this position in recruiting and that the entire program has been in going into the 24 season from a production yep. standpoint. I mean, you, the same thing that we have talked about in recruiting, we feel the same way. I feel the same way because you haven't had a chance to come down and actually see a practice yet, Double R. But I have not. After, yep. after, after what I saw, you flip a coin. Which, which one? Uh, it's, take CJ out of the equation and le- and just say he's on the Kenny Minchie path yep. of being the scout quarterback and learn. The other three flip a coin. We can get to the playoffs with any of the other three. It, yep. just the, the, all of them are confident 
All of them have physical tools. And I've said it before, man. Steve Angeli is not backing down. He is yeah. super confident. And that only makes everybody in the room better, that type of competition, right? And this is what we've seen from Alabama, uh, Washington, other top programs. Stat talent in the quarterback room. If someone transfers, okay, keep stacking talent. That's what allowed Nick Saban to transition from being a run-heavy defensive team to, okay, now I'm going to explosive offenses because I'm stacking different style quarterbacks. Remember that as well. He went from Jalen Hurts to Tua. Like, that's <laughs> two totally – and he was able to win and get the championship games with two different styles, but you have to be able to stack the quarterback room regardless of the style. And that's what I love. And you can you can tap into this. It lets me know, based upon the quarterbacks that they're recruiting, they're not afraid to coach. They're embracing coaching the position rather than it looked like the previous guys that recruited the quarterback position recruited to a style. They wanted guys that fit this mold, this body type. And now it seems like they're comfortable going to get a Jared Kurtz. Or they're comfortable yeah. getting the right alliance. Like, whomever it yeah. is, yeah. it's our job to coach and develop yep. that young man. That's refreshing as well. Yep. I just think it's become a much more attractive situation to be in if you're a quarterback coming to the University of Notre Dame. I and mean, we, we, Sean, we've talked about it. I mean, literally, Notre Dame has stacked, like, this is the last three years. Kenny Minchie, CJ Carr, Deuce Knight. And they did that? With a pretty underwhelming passing offense over the last couple of years. Pretty mm -hmm. underwhelming. Can you imagine how attractive the quarterback position at the University of Notre Dame? Because we know from a branding perspective and from a monetary perspective, that's a very attractive position to be in, is to be the mm -hmm. quarterback at Notre Dame. Could you imagine, though, if you now take the upbeats? Like, if, if Riley Leonard has a big season in 2024, that showcases that, like, hey, things are different here at quarterback. I mean, you're just starting to, I think, kind of, fill in the gaps of why you would want to come play quarterback at the University of Notre Dame. And, you know, you mentioned it, guys like Steve Angeli, CJ Carr, Kenny Minchie, the next wave of quarterbacks taking a massive step forward under Gino Gadulli. That's going to be big time for Notre Dame over the last couple of years and uh, next couple of years and getting another big time quarterback in 2026. Cause I'm not, I think someone said like no more placeholders in the class, Sean, where it's like, you just take a guy because he wants to come and you like him enough. It's like, Notre Dame, I think, is shooting for elite guys every single year, just about, right? And they're shooting for CJ to deuce. And then if they get like Ryder Lions, like everyone wants Ryder Lions. Like his offer list is expanding quickly, mm -hmm. right? So just keep getting dudes, and that position will do well as long as you can develop it properly. And I, I trust this staff more than I have staffs in the past of getting as much as you can out of the quarterback position. Like that was a spot that you just did not get enough at over the last couple of years. So quarterback. Well taken care of in 2026. Moving forward, this again, this is what the board looks like, guys. It's going to change very quickly on Sunday. We're not showing you any of the players that have not been offered by the University of Notre Dame yet during the pot of gold. This is just what the board looks like today for 2026. And by the way, I think I mentioned at the beginning, but if I didn't, we're not doing a mailbag at the end. So if you have any questions or anything that you're wondering about any of the topics we're talking about, please put it in the chat as a super chat, and then we would get to it. But we're not going to hit a mailbag at the end because you know we're a little busy <laughs> it's a it's a busy couple days someone checked in with me yesterday sean and they were like hey man i i had a question for you on the board i know you're probably busy and i'm like i'm like man i it's been a busy couple days man i just for some some context i've written about 30 offer stories in the last three days <laughs> like it's been a it's been a wild couple days man but we are rocking and rolling heading toward sunday Sean, real quick, uh, offensively, not too much a conversation to go about because, again, quarterbacks is one that we've gotten a lot of you know insight in, insights into how Notre Dame's trending. But right now, only one running back on the board, Jonas, uh, J Jonas Walton out of Georgia, who will obviously be offered again on Sunday, but there's going to be several other running backs that are going to join that conversation. Wide receiver group, decent amount of wide receivers as of today before the pot of gold. Really funny one, though, Sean, because we'll talk about it at the end. California has been kind of hit or miss with Notre Dame over the last couple years. Not that Notre Dame hasn't gotten guys out of California, but I just mean the number of targets that Notre Dame has targeted out of California. It's been, I feel like, a little bit lower. We're going to talk about it, but California is going to be very important for 2026. 
And I think that's exemplified by you see six names at wide receiver right now today. Five out of six are from the state of California and the other one's from Florida. So I think that's a pretty good sign. But, you know, even though I guess technically we can count Chris Henry Jr. as an Ohio guy technically because he just transferred the modern day. But regardless, he's a California guy for now, I guess. So a lot of California kids and then only one true offensive lineman on the board as of today. And we expect that number to expand. The second part of this conversation is going to be a lot. Oh man, what did I just do? I just hit a button and that did not work out well. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. I just hit a button. Sean, you ever accidentally hit a button and you're like, I don't know where this is taking me. And that, that just happened yeah. in 10 seconds. Ago. That was fantastic. So let's go to the defensive board, Sean. And this is going to take a lot less time because we're going to get into the 2026 class here, guys, as far as what you should expect on Sunday and how much the, the pot of gold means for Notre Dame's branding moving forward. But this is the, the offer list for the defensive side of the ball today before the pot of gold, Sean. Nine players on the defensive side of the football have been offered by Notre Dame in 2026. For context, guys, I just talked about we just talked about seven quarterbacks that have been offered by Notre Dame. Seven quarterbacks, only nine defensive players. You should expect the majority of offers. I don't, I don't even know what the percentage is, but it's a high percentage of offers coming on the defensive side of the ball on Sunday. We have three safeties, three corners, two linebackers, and a defensive tackle, Sean. That's all. So defensive heavy on Sunday, my friend. A lot of defense. And you love that, right? And we've talked about what – but see, this is – they've gone position by position, question by question, in my opinion. I think the first reality was – and the first domino of the progression of Marcus Freeman in this program was the recognition of, all right, we got to go get Sam Hart, or which ended up being Sam Hart. But it was the recognition that things have to change in this room for us to take the next step in the program. As a defensive coordinator, he had already recognized we need to get longer and more athletic. And that went into play early on in his recruiting classes as defensive coordinator and extended into when he became a head coach with guys like Jalen Sneed, on, so on and so forth. Now they know. We have production from Riley Mills, Howard Cross, who both of us would probably say without being disrespectful or not with the intent of disrespecting, they've overachieved. These, yeah. these Spe- are guys. Especially who, Howard Cross. Especially Howard absolutely. Cross. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. With the production they've given Notre Dame, they've overachieved expectations yeah. from the time they came to Notre Dame. And you love that. But you don't yeah. want to live on that cliff at Notre Dame. You want to go get some guys that can be studs. That have attitudes like a Sean, Sean Civiliano Jr., where you look, I'm, I'm trying to get to the NFL. Like, right. that, that's his mindset. Yeah, I love Notre Dame. I love the education, but I'm coming here to get to the NFL. It's nothing wrong with having that mindset and going after kids like that. You know, defensively, this is what we've seen. You know, no, no more do we have uh, the previous era, which Notre Dame was incredible under BK defensively because they lived off development defensively, especially up front. Every now and then they would get, you know, a guy like a Jerry Tillery who was just talented, right? Or a Sheldon Day, right? Every now they would get a Stefan to it. But that wasn't like every year we were, you know, reloading at that position. And it was built basically on development right and you have to tip your cap to the coaches and the staffs and the dcs that were able to continue that trend i don't think marcus freeman wants to live in that area i think in every position he wants to get more athletic he talked about kingston after the first practice like every now and then you see a kid and you say okay he, he's gonna have a chance early how, how, how did kingston look in person to you sean he looked he's good. small he's small <laughs> He's small, he's really? good. Yeah, he. I mean, in comparison, you see Drake Bowen lining up in oh, middle like linebacker. Oh, you, you mean like bulky, right? Like <laughs> yeah, bulky. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's going to add weight. He, you could tell. Yeah, he's small. He's smallish, but he's so, yeah. In high school, he was so imposing. He looked bigger <laughs> on the field than he really is. And then you compare him to the other guys that have been in the weight program. And you see right. Drake, and you're like, okay, <laughs> okay. But once again, that points out because I feel like JD Bertrand was a he got to a point where he wasn't as small as he was yeah. when he first started playing. Yeah. But if, he, if, if you put JD next to Drake, 
that's that's too totally you're talking about six three like that's it's totally it's a totally different body type and this is these yeah. are the changes right same thing with the wide receiver room like yo we we've never watched the practice where it was that much speed at the wide receiver position we just haven't and so everybody's up top looking like just looking at each other like who's that <laughs> what's happening here yeah is this like is this ai is that, right. like did they, right. are they showing us something that's like generated it is really uh, just reflective of the impressions from a recruiting standpoint where they came in like Home Depot and there were questions and this staff was committed to finding the answers right. in recruiting. And I think what you talked about, what we're going to see in the 26th class, which I think has been answered, one, one, one of the continuing questions for us mm -hmm. that we feel like has been answered was safety. The 25 class answered that. And, and and it could get even better. Right? So they continue to build and answer the questions that have been long-standing questions from a recruiting standpoint. And they still hold fast to, yo, we always have offensive linemen. We always get good cornerbacks. We always get good running backs. We always get, get good tight ends, but now we're starting to answer the other questions that have been issues for a long time in recruiting. And that is what we're going to see, I think, in mass with the offers that are going out on the defensive side of the ball yep. on Sunday. Yep, so we're going to see a lot of names, guys. We'll talk about them on Monday, some of the names that really pop out to us. We'll have the nice little spreadsheet for you all to talk about that when we do. But for now... I think just a couple of quick notes here that I would just drop to you all as far as like early impressions on 2026. Notre Dame's in a good spot with Telenoa Ely, who is a linebacker kind of hybrid player, line, a second level defender out of California. He speaks very highly of Notre Dame. I would say Notre Dame is in a is is trending in a great direction early on in that one. Mm -hmm. I think the other kid too. I don't know if you've seen him, Sean, but Albert Hill, who's a mm -hmm. corner out of Ohio, a little bit of a smaller kid right now. He's only 5'10", 160 pounds. And I think that's verified. It's pretty close to in that ballpark. You would, I mean, he's getting recruited by a lot of big time programs, but Albert Hill actually went to the same high school as Marcus Freeman and Mike Mickens. So they have a little bit of a, a connection there. So keep an eye out for Albert Hill as well. And then maybe the most athletic kid that's on this list is Jet Washington, who's out of Bishop Gorman, the six foot four, 185 pound safety. Some people are recruiting him as a wide receiver. Notre Dame is obviously recruiting him as a safety. So keep an eye out for a couple of those positions. But there will be a lot more names that we'll throw out to you guys on Monday. We're going to get to the next segment here in a second. We're going to talk about why Pot of Gold matters. We're going to talk about the uniqueness of it. And then we're also going to talk about the 2025 class as far as who was offered during the pot of gold last year and how much impact did that have on those specific players before we do transition quick, but hit that like button, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and hit that notification bell at the bottom of the screen. If you're listening to us on YouTube, if you're listening to us um, on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's Apple, Spotify or anything in between, make sure you subscribe and hit a five-star review on there as well. Boards that I breakdown.com. We'll have a lot of conversation on Sunday and then obviously going into Monday on the pot of gold, but we'll get to the next conversation here shortly on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. Sean, I want to have a great conversation about what the pot of gold means. And I saw someone ask a question in the chat. Again, no mailbag today, folks. So if you want a question answered, if there's anything pressing, super chats are what we're taking today. Just don't have enough time for a mailbag today, but super chats will be very much appreciated as always. Let's talk about the, just the, the overall thoughts on the pot of gold, Sean, before we start getting into the impact that it's had over the last couple of years. And then we'll get into some 2026 conversation, but I, Sean, so for people that don't know, this is something that actually Chad Bowden did not start at Notre Dame. This was actually a Mike Elston thing. So Mike Elston started, uh, he was the recruiting coordinator at the time, quote unquote, part of his title as defensive line coach. And he started this conversation of the pot of gold centered around St. Patrick's Day, right? Well, I would say this though, over the last couple of years now, Chad Bowden has taken it to a whole other level. Mike Elston had a great idea and it started out in a great footing but Chad Bowen has built upon that over the last couple of years. Now we head into 2024, the 2024 version of pot and gold with the 2026 class, Sean. 
And it's going to be very unique because you still have Chad Bowden, obviously, still have Marcus Freeman, the head of the head of this recruiting effort. But now Dre Brown is the new director of recruiting with Chad Bowden taking on general manager. Obviously, we don't think it's going to change too much of what Chad's doing on a day-to-day perspective, but Dre will obviously have a little bit even more of a part of this process going into the pot of gold. But let's start off just quite simply, Sean. I think, and I would love to hear your perspective. You are the fighting Irish at the University of Notre Dame. You have a holiday that is centered around being Irish, right? Rare green, kiss me, I'm Irish. Let's go drink some beer. You have a whole holiday that is dedicated to of Irish descent, right? And I think that it is so strategic and so smart of Notre Dame to utilize this because obviously this isn't about the University of Notre Dame. This is what wasn't why St. Patrick's Day was was a thing, became a thing. But they are utilizing this holiday of being proud of being Irish to magnify and to increase their pull to recruits and the uniqueness of it. I think that it is a very strategic thing for Notre Dame to utilize this holiday to help their recruiting efforts, especially where it lands on the calendar, like in the off season, recruiting starting to get heavy. You have unofficial visitors for the 2026 class starting this month. A lot of, a lot of movement that's going to be made in 2026, just in general, this off season. I think it's a great thing for Notre Dame to be able to utilize this holiday and to take advantage of some of this momentum moving forward. Absolutely. I kind of reference this to or refer to the, the music industry in a sense where you have independent artists and then you have label artists. And when you're a label artist, everything is taken care of within the confines of marketing sales of the corporation. And there's nothing for the artist to really worry about. This is another byproduct of independence. And independence is always a much tougher route more work has to be done and notre dame is never going to truly benefit from the recruiting circuit the way that other teams will because things are skewed for whatever relationships and reasons and we've seen that you can connect it to the rankings how notre dame players are dropped at certain times of the year going into the spring and summer their commits all of that so for Notre Dame to recognize in our independence, we have to give ourselves or create our own eyebrow raising moment that causes the national landscape to focus in on us for this time. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. You can go from there. And after that, the next thing is the Irish invasion. Like Notre Dame has to do that, right? Their independence just doesn't stop with the TV deal. Their independence goes throughout the entire football program. They have to put in more work than most top teams in the nation or most top programs in the nation. And like you said, the branding of it, connecting it to there is no day other than St. Patrick's Day. You know, there's, in no, this there's, there's no Crimson Tide Day out there, Shaw. There's no, no. there's no Georgia Bulldog Day. There is no. Patrick's Day, though. Yes, Yo, the Chicago River is going to be literally going to be green on Sunday. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, they paint it green. They dye it green on Sunday. So, just the vibe and the way the entire country embraces that particular day, it is literally a national platform for Notre Dame to grab hold to that fits what Notre Dame represents to say, this is our day, this is our time, and these are our guys that we would love to be a part of this program. It is it's, it's one of the best things that I've seen from a recruiting standpoint. And I'm happy that Mike Elson, I don't know if he saw how big it could become when he yes. initially started it. When he had but the vision. It really, yes, it continues to grow. It absolutely continues to grow. And it's growing quite literally from volume, Sean. I looked back mm-hmm. at the numbers last year. There was 80-something offers that were extended last year. I'm bracing everyone right now. On Sunday, there are going to be almost 120 players in the 2026 class of recruits that are going to be offered on Sunday, Sean. This event is getting bigger quite literally every single year. It, it is going to be it's going to be an exhausting Sunday, to be honest, for us. But for Notre Dame fans, they're going to love it. For Notre Dame recruits, they are going to love it. 
because I think it's just such a different perspective on the program. Like it's playful and fun, of course. Right. But it's also, it's, it, it, it's like being part of a group, right? Like that's how I would kind of phrase it, Sean. Like only yeah. I, I can say like almost 120 kids. And that sounds like a lot to everyone, but think about it this way, Sean, only a hundred and uh, less, a little less than 120 kids are going to get offered out of thousands of kids that are a part of the 2026 class nationally, thousands and thousands. That's they like, like I'll, I'll use one of the quarterbacks, for example, because they're going to get offered again on Sunday, technically, but they're already all on the office, but like Ryder Lions, let's use Ryder for an example. Ryder Lions is going to get his official pot of gold offer, right? And he can hold that offer up metaphorically and literally say, I'm only a hundred and whatever kids in the entire country that mm -hmm. got this. The entire country. I think that that's a part of being, I think that's almost a part of a group, right? Like you think about that and you're like, man, that's an honor. Like I'm only, I'm only a hundred something kids nationally that got this honor. Right. So I think that also brings to the uniqueness of it, man, that like you are a part of a, I want to say prestigious, but like you're a part of a very special group to get this offer that not everybody gets. Mm -hmm. But it plays so, into, yeah. it plays into what we know, right? Once again, Notre Dame having to do it a different way. Notre Dame has to jump out early or earlier than most top programs yeah. because of their independence and because of the way they do things and because of who Notre Dame is from an academic standpoint, which is another thing that's impressive about this 26 class. We've had the opportunity to be um, to have access to the, the academic progress of some of these guys in the 26th class and it's it's pretty impressive Brian so people make it seem like you know good football players don't have grades like oh yeah they like, do they do they do <laughs> they, they absolutely do so this is just another another example man of Notre Dame taking advantage it's a disadvantage to be independent but when you're independent you can move the way you want to move and if you're good enough and smart enough to take advantage of your strengths, which Notre Dame continues to seem to be able to do, yep. then who you are is no, no longer a negative. It definitely becomes a positive. So the springboard from, yo, Sunday to blue and gold to mm -hmm. Irish invasion, like that, that small pocket right there is the impact for Notre Dame. Yep. And then within there, that's why we see Notre Dame usually in their classes. They start stacking up commitments like May, June, July. And it's like, OK, mm -hmm. why? Because of the way they do it. It's different. You won't see a lot of Notre Dame commitments coming in the fall in a class. Like right. you'll get a few, you know, mm -hmm. them tying up the loose ends on the class. But Notre Dame is usually going to be very effective spring, mm -hmm. summer. When it comes to recruiting, Sean, here, here's a funny question. Someone asked me the other day, and it, it's pretty interesting to think about. Someone asked, when do you think the first commitment in 2026 is going to be? And I'm like, well, the last two years, when did it first happen? Well, who was the first each, each year? It was at what? It was at the blue and gold. Blue and gold. I thought maybe it was the gold game. Did they get one before blue and gold last year? No, no. So blue and gold two years ago was Brandon Davis Swain. Who of course you're right. You're right. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Who of course is is I believe he's enrolled at Colorado now. Colorado now. now. Yeah. yeah. The other one was Davion Dixon this past year. He was an he was another blue uh spring. He was a blue and gold guy. And that one, so both of those though, Sean, because people keep asking, like, who's you know, who's gonna be the first guy and when it's gonna be. Both those guys were surprises for different reasons. Like I I I Brandon Davis went that that situation was just kind of weird overall. Davion. I knew Davion really liked Notre Dame a lot, and I probably would have picked Notre Dame to be his suitor at that time, but like, yeah. I would not have predicted Davion to come off the board right then. I, right I would then. not yeah. have. Yeah. So the, the blue gold game is pro usually kind of a springboard uh, going yeah. into junior seasons. Like, it, So will it happen this year on, on spring game? I have no idea. But if you're asking me when does it typically happen, that's yeah. usually when the first guy comes off the board, at least the last couple of years. So yeah. we'll see. Sean, I need to ask you a question. Because this is what people on Twitter are going to say, okay? Not Notre Dame fans. When they start seeing mm -hmm. these pot of golds going out and they start seeing the leprechaun stuff and everything, right? 
I want you to just react to this, rebut it, however you want to take this, okay? You know what? The pot of gold is stupid. That's so corny. Like it, it's, 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 it's just childish. Like, what is the point of this? Like your leprechauns, your green pot of gold is dumb. It's stupid. I, double R. I don't know what else to tell them, man. You know what I've come to realize that in life there are always different perspectives. You know, and some people, you know, like to be. You know, whether it's the old guy, the middle aged guys, you know, standing on the lawn, feeling like they have to defend tradition and the way things were and anything that is colorful, insightful, different, you know, they want to spit on it. They don't recognize the way of the world and where things are going. And what you have, once again, Notre Dame cannot depend on traditional recruiting and that circuit. They have to be different. Their independence is bigger than just on the field and the TV deal. It impacts everything else and the way they move, who they are, their academics. That definitely dictate, look, we have to go about things this way. And in order to do that, you have to be creative. They're being creative. Would you rather them just sit on their laurels and just tell kids, hey, we're Notre Dame. That's good enough. How has that worked as college football has evolved, double R? How has that stance worked? We're Notre Dame. You should count it an honor to come here. How has that worked for us? Not too well, right? Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. No, you could you could do that in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, even. You can't do that anymore. No, but I'm sure Notre Dame and Chad and, and Dre and everybody else send in emails. If you have a more creative idea that you feel is not as corny. Send it in. They, yeah. I'm sure they would love to hear from you. But until then, support what they're doing because it's very important to the overall success of what Notre Dame can do on the recruiting trail. Support. Yeah. That, that's, that's it. There's a lot of things in life that I think, eh, I don't know about that, but I have to admit, well, the kids love it. I can listen to a song and say, that is the corniest song in the world. How in the world did that make it to radio? <laughs> But you know what? The kids love it. It must be something. It's a it hit. Something. Yeah. yeah. It's a hit. So well, that that's that's that that was that that's my main point, Sean, is that is it corny? Yes. It's recruiting. It's supposed to be corny. We're talking about things that are going to appeal to a 15, 16, 17 year old, right? Like those things are we can make fun of it all all we want. We can make fun of the photo shoots and we can make fun of the leprechaun thing and, and CIA and the uh, CIA agents last year that Chad and the recruiting staff were dressed up. Like we can make fun of it all we want, but the kids love it. Mm -hmm. they do. It's playful. They really, really like it. I mean, there might be one or two kids that don't love it. Right. And they don't end up in Notre Dame, but like for the majority of them, they do really like it. Like even the kids that don't end up in Notre Dame for the most part really do like it. So I, I would love for Marcus Freeman one day, to be able to bring kids into his office on junior day and have multiple national titles behind him in the rings on his table and just sit in his chair and say, yeah, this is what can happen for you. He has the work to get there though. So for now he has to have Chad and the guys dress up in black suits, like men in black with, you know, the whole secret service earpieces in and they have to make it creative. They have to make Notre Dame appealing. We just talked about how Notre Dame to quarterbacks nationally is an appealing position now. Mm -hmm. More appealing than it was. Okay, Marcus Freeman and his staff, they're trying to make Notre Dame more appealing and they're willing to do anything and what do. They're willing to do whatever. They're willing to embarrass themselves. Yeah, some kids might be like, come on, man. Yeah, but come on, it's engaging. Right. It causes conversation. It's something they remember. Yeah. Right. Yes. Chad or, is or, not... or or you break into a car and a kid's sleeping and they don't take that one too well. Yes. But otherwise, yes. Right. Yep. You are correct. And then Chad will get on a Zoom with the with the prospects or the recruits and sing. He's he's willing to do that to yep. be able to create an atmosphere <laughs> that's successful for Notre Dame on a recruiting trip. Would you rather have people trying? 
or people like we said just sitting and waiting and saying oh oh we got the biggest recruit in town i'll, I'll be to the building when i get done with my last nine holes <laughs> oh, would, you, would you rather like that approach yeah that actually existed a decade ago Man, I've heard some horror stories. I'm not even talking about Brian Kelly. I've heard some horror stories about other Notre Dame coaches as far as their uh, efforts on the recruiting trail. <laughs> so yes, I've heard, I've heard those stories. I literally talked to a former Notre Dame player that gave me a little bit of insight into some of his past. And again, this wasn't a Brian Kelly thing. I'm not even talking about mm. Brian Kelly here. But and Sean, you want to talk about the impact it's had in 2025? So I'm going to list you the commitments in the 2025 class that were offered on. Pot of Gold Day last year. Okay, so here we go. Mm -hmm. Quarterback, Deuce Knight. Tight end, James Flanagan. Defensive tackle, Davion Dixon. Defensive end, Christopher Burgess. Hybrid linebacker, Viper, Dominic Hulak. Linebacker, Josiah Kia. Cornerback, Cree Thomas. Were all offered on Pot of Gold, Sean. So that is... Is that seven players I just named? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven players of the 17 commitments that Notre Dame has in the 2026 class were offered during the pot of gold last year. And that's not even counting, Sean, because there's a few key targets that are still on the board that were offered during pot of gold as well. We got mm -hmm. Taylor and Taylor, wide receiver out of out of Illinois, was offered. Jerome Bettis Jr., obviously the legacy, was offered on St. Patrick's Day last year. Marco Jones, star linebacker out of California, was offered then. So was Christian Jones. So was Anthony Saka. So was Nathaniel Owusu Botang, although he did have an offer before then, but he was a part of the pot of gold last year. And Dallas Golden were all offered during the pot of gold. So when you look at it, Sean, at the end of it, I would say Notre Dame is going to have maybe 11 or 12 players in their class that were offered on pot of gold last year. So if we want proof that this matters and that this has an impact, yes, the board's going to expand after the pot of gold. You know, they're uh -huh. they're going to get players to camp. They're going to extend offers after the pot of gold. Like this isn't just the end all. This is what the class is going to be. This is what the board's going to look like. But it obviously does have an impact based upon what we saw in 2025. And once again, it is in this world, you know, it's all about branding, right? You brand yourself, dude. You brand yourself not only for where you are now, but you brand yourself for the possibilities of the future as well. Notre Dame has done an incredible look. That's why Chad got the pay raise and the it's elevation. Amazing. Yep. Because of the work he's done in expanding the brand and reestablishing. He there was some reestablishment that was needed when Chad got here or got the position. Like the recruiting perception of Notre Dame when he took over was not in the best place. It was not, it was in a free fall in a lot of different areas. And so they had to get back to ground level. And then after laying the foundation, they had to continue to build. And that's what each class has done. We're sitting here saying, as we're on the verge of Sunday and what it's going to do to ignite the 26 class double R. Yep. We're we're talking about that as we sit in the midst of the 25 class saying this could be Marcus Freeman's best overall class. Uh, so awesome. you see yeah. Yeah. it's like the foundation is laid. Now here's the first few, few floors, uh, the next few floors and it continues to grow. The only thing that we're waiting to support that from what we see as an evaluation standpoint is the manifestation on the field, right? Playoff performance, wins in the playoffs, possible national championship. If that ends up being the case, then we're really going to see the escalation of recruiting because that's really the only missing piece based upon the questions that needed to be answered that seemingly have already been answered or in the process of being answered. So yeah. look, this is an exciting time to be a Notre Dame fan. And of course, we all have to wait and see, you know, because it's very similar to, you know, a baseball team having a bunch of young prospects, right? It's the excitement of, okay, can they win a championship? We'll see. But heck, it's going to be real fun watching. I can tell you that because it's fun covering 
Yeah, it's fun covering and talking to these young men. And yep. the love, I think you point this, Double R, the genuine love and respect from recruits, regardless of whether or not they end up at Notre Dame. Yep. It's a lot of love for Notre Dame and the football program and the staff. It really is amongst these recruits. And I, I think, Sean, another thing, too, is, is we talk about, you know, the corniness and stuff. Notre Dame has to make themselves cool for some of these kids, right? Because let's be like two things that are honest here, right? Is mm -hmm. one, one, Notre Dame is a long way away from their last national championship. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. For all these kids growing up, Notre Dame wasn't Notre Dame that you know, right? That Brian knows mm -hmm. that like a little bit of an older crowd knows that Notre Dame is not quite that brand as far as on the field right now. They need to get back there. That's one. Two. I think about Deuce Knight when I say this. I'm not sure a quarterback from the state of Mississippi grew up thinking, I want to play football for the blue and gold of Notre Dame. I don't think that that was ever a thought that crossed mm -hmm. the Deuce Knight's mind. I'm sure a thought was, you know, like, like Crimson Tide, they're pretty good, right? Like, they're pretty cool. I got a couple, you know, Tennessee, the, the, the burn, burn Orange, like, that's pretty, that's pretty dope. That's pretty cool, right? I don't know. If until a moment like the pot of gold where they send all this cool stuff and they get you up to campus and you finally see yourself that uniform, I don't know if a quarterback from the state of Mississippi ever once thought, you know what, it'd be pretty cool. It'd be pretty cool to go up to South Bend, Indiana. That'd be pretty neat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that ever happened. These types of events make that become a reality a little bit. Like, oh, wow, this is different. This is unique. That's, I don't know, man. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about that. And like, I, 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 there's plenty of guys like that too. I, Jaden Greathouse, 2023 class. Do I think Jaden Greathouse grew up being like, yeah, man, I want to catch footballs in South Bend, Indiana. I don't mm -hmm. think that ever happens. He was definitely think, you know, growing up. I think he's going to hook them horn. Yeah. You know, I, that's what I was, was going to say. Well, yeah. like, I'm going to go catch this for the Longhorns. Right. Like, yeah. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go up to South Bend, Indiana, but I think this early introduction to the program, early introduction, that's, it's different. That kind of yeah. has, its, it resonates with you a little bit when you can finally start to feel it, right? You start to feel it. This is what, this is what the pot of gold is to me. It's your first real deep exposure to Notre Dame football. What does that mean? What is the uniqueness of it? Can I be different? Like those things are all what kind of matters on a day like today. So yeah. That's where we are today, folks. Again, 2025 class has seven commits currently of the 17 that were a part of Pot of Gold last year. And I would also say that uh, maybe there will be one soon that might push that to eight. We'll see what things happen. Obviously, they're pretty soon here. So that's this section of the podcast. We're going to get into 2026, guys. Strengths, numbers. We're getting all of it. Getting you ready for the pot of gold on Sunday. Before we do, hit that like button for me. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Hit that notification bell. If you're listening to me on your favorite podcast platform, listen to us on your favorite podcast platform. Five-star reviews are very much appreciated. Make sure you're subscribed over there. Make sure you go to boardsirishbreakdown.com. I have a lot of articles ready for you on Sunday. We'll have reaction pieces, me and Sean both talking to some of these kids, their thoughts on Pot of Gold, everything and anything you need at IrishBreakdown.com. We'll get to the last section, talking 2026 Primer, here on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. All right, Sean, we have dove deep into this board. For people that don't know, <laughs> we have a little bit of insight into a lot of the players that will be offered on Sunday. We're not going to put names in the universe that have not been offered because that's the whole point of the event is that they get to announce it. It's cool. It's different. Let's be a part of it. But we have gotten a chance to really kind of dig into the class. So we wanted to throw out some numbers and just some early observations in 2026 because I think areas of strength and understanding where Notre Dame might be looking at a lot of talents and where the talent might be training in 2026 is big for Notre Dame. That's from a national perspective, right? Like if, if, this and we'll talk about this in a second, but like if the state of Illinois is having a down year as far as the number of talent, the level of talent in a particular year, I don't want them going into Illinois just to willy nilly. Like I want them to go in with players there and in good volume, right? So let's talk about 2026, Sean. A little bit of areas. I want to throw out a number to you, which I thought was 
Very interesting. Okay. So this time last year, Sean, one of the main things we kept talking about, and obviously you have a lot of relevance to this because of where you are in Chicago. Last year, we're talking about, man, there's a lot of dudes in, in Chicago this year, man. A lot of dudes in Illinois, right? A lot of them. And this time last year, we're talking about, you need to get Christopher Burgess. You need to get Taylor Taylor. You need to go after Dominic Kulak. You need to get all these Illinois guys. And then obviously we found out about a couple Indiana guys after that, like Mark Zachary and Damian Shanklin. And the home base, though, is strong in 2025. A lot of talents, even some talent that didn't necessarily fit Notre Dame potentially, right? But there's a lot of talent. Going into 2026, Sean, people should expect a lower number of players, at least offered initially in the Chicago, Illinois area and the state of Indiana. We're expecting a very lower number comparative to 2025. It seems like, I don't want to call it a down year. I would just say there's a little bit less volume of great players that Notre Dame is going to be looking at in 2026 compared to 2025. Just a quick observation there. Well, once again, Notre Dame needs to be in a position because you're talking about a city in an area in recruiting versus no one says the recruiting in Illinois. No one says that. It's Chicago and the Chicagoland area. That is really the crux of where the big programs come to to get the best players. You know, you have some downstate players or some technically East St. Louis is in Illinois, right? But East St. Louis has consistently been a pipeline to the Big 12 or the SEC for years, right? Notre Dame has capitalized and gotten into the St. Louis area yeah. on the other side of the bridge and have been very successful being able to get top talent like a Jeremiah Love or a Christian Gray to mm-hmm. come to Notre Dame. So now when you compare, you're talking Chicago to, oh, the state of Indiana, the state yep. of Florida, the state of California, like Chicagoland is a state in recruiting. You basically. know, even though it's, <laughs> it's basically a state in recruiting, so people will poo-poo it and say, well, Man, it doesn't compare to this. It doesn't compare to that. Yeah, you're comparing a, man, one-fifth of a state or one-fourth of a state to actual states in recruiting. And once again, Notre Dame, the brand, who they are, have to how the relatability to Chicago and the Chicagoans who grew up watching Notre Dame football and have passed it down for generations, it should be an easy place to plant the flag. And it should be an easy place for kids growing up to say, man, like Jaden Greathouse grew up wanting and watching Texas football. These kids should grow up with the brand of Notre Dame bombarding them as they grow up, right? Even if they don't choose to go. And that puts Notre Dame in position like in 26, where it might not be quantity like the 25 class, but the quality is still there. And that's what you want in Notre Dame. You want to be in a position where every year the top two or three kids, we can go get the top three three kids. We're not trying to get the top five or six or seven. It's different, right? Texas and Texas A&M, they might feel like we need to get the top five or six kids from the state. That's a much larger area. Notre Dame, Chicagoland area, man, let's give us the top three kids. If we can get the top four kids and they're really top level kids, that's a great year. And it's no different. And and This is a year coming off of, this is a great thing. Coming off of what people will perceive as one of the biggest misses, right? Because of an offer wasn't made last year on March 17th. One of the biggest misses probably. Two two years ago, right? Two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. Yeah, 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 that would be two years ago. Yep. Huge miss, definitely impacted things. But now you get in early on these kids, you get the offers, but that's because the work has been done, right? You come from that, you learn from that, right? You get the best defensive lineman in the 25 class, right? There's one thing there in Notre Dame answering the, the questions that have been there. Yep. They have to improve up front. They get Burgess in 25. They get Hulock, yes. who's interchangeable. Are they going to play him in yep. Viper, linebacker? Is he going to mm-hmm. play in? They're answering the questions. They're getting the talent. And this year, Joseph, the Joseph class, Reef. Joseph in Reef. Yep. Absolutely. And this year now, because I, I wonder if this, this is what they've recognized from a talent evaluator 
I, I would mm -hmm. be interested in getting your standpoint. The 26 class, once again, is going to answer or has a chance to answer the defensive front for Notre Dame yeah. in the Chicago land area. Yes. And I'm, yep. I'm starting to think maybe you identify certain states with certain things, right? And maybe they've identified like, okay, the defensive line, Chicago has the answer, like and Indiana from that yep. standpoint, you know, in 25 and 26, you're getting guys on the defensive line. Maybe they're saying, okay, we don't have to go out and fight to get impact players in these at these particular positions because they're literally in our backyard. And if we can capitalize on these positions in our backyard, I mean, the best up to be honest, one of the best of them all in 26 has already been identified as probably not a fit. One of the best defensive players in the 26 class. Yeah, defensively has already been identified as not a fit, but you, the work has been put in. The kid mm -hmm. has been on campus. They've done the work. They've gotten to know him. And the decision was made and you don't have right. a problem with that. You, you have a problem when you feel like the work is not being done. And I think that yes. situation has been solved as far as Chicago, Indiana, surrounding areas, because it was an issue, let's say two years ago, and it's no longer an issue. I. This 26 class from a defensive standpoint up front and that in Chicago has a chance. And you put that on top of 25, you, you're definitely closing the gap. I, I think you make a great point, Sean, because you know what I think of when I think of Chicago? I mm -hmm. think of a lot of great basketball players, right? Mm -hmm. I think of a lot of great basketball. And I ask myself, like, what translates to being a long, athletic, twitched up dude, right? And defensive line is where that translates to. So I am not surprised at all that Chicago is developing some really talented defensive linemen, right? Like we talked about Christopher Burgess in 2025, Marquise Lightfoot in 2024. Like Chicago is getting those types of guys. I mean, even Justin Scott obviously is included in that, but I was, I was, my mind was kind of going more long defensive ends than defensive mm -hmm. tackles. But regardless, I start thinking about twitchy long athletes. And those usually are defensive linemen. And I will tell you guys, again, we can't put names out there, but there is a 2026 Chicago-based defensive lineman that I'm going to be giddy about on <laughs> Monday when we talk about him, Sean, because I watched this film and I'm like, oh, got it. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. there, man. I see what mm -hmm. you guys see already. And it was funny enough is I don't even think he was really, I don't even think he's really rent as of now. And I'm just like, oh, well, he will be. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that. So, yes, Chicago is going to be important. It's going to be very important in 2026 for getting a couple instrumental pieces for Notre Dame in 2026. I don't think we'll be talking about the same number of players ultimately from Chicago or even Indiana in this conversation, the home base, but we'll be talking about very important players, which is still obviously essential for Notre Dame to be able to close on there. So, we will talk about that moving forward, obviously, that Chicago, Indiana are spots that Notre Dame needs to be able to get players that they want. There's no excuses to not get a Chicago kid. If he fits, if you love him, you should be able to get that kid almost every single time. Almost every single time. Sean, I wanted to throw a number out there for you because this is – I talked about this on IB Nation Sports, uh, Sports Talk this week. This is wild, man. All right, so – if I ask, actually let me start a conversation this way, I'm going to ask you, give me the top four states in your opinion, as far as putting out consistent high level talents every year, volume perspective. California, Georgia, Texas. Shoot. I mean, it's easy to say Florida. I mean, just off the bat, it's say, Florida, say it again. California, say, say Georgia, it again. Uh, Florida, Texas, California, Georgia. Absolutely. Just, you get yeah, it. That's the core. core, that's the right? core. I started to overthink it. You know, then yeah. I'm like, no, that's. <laughs> Someone that's... said Maine in the chat. Someone said Maine. That is fantastic. Malik, would say, fantastic. Malik would say Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> that's Connecticut is putting like... out more talent. They're putting out more talent, man. They are. They are. Putting out more talent. I think PA. Uh, well, uh, can I take that? I think. <laughs> uh oh. Here we go. No, no, no. There would be a. And I'm only saying this because I know mm -hmm. Archer probably feels this way. I got Archer. Ohio would have a debate. 
Ohio is a very good state. Debate. Yeah. I, I would say this. Ohio's a really good state. Pennsylvania's kind of doing it a little bit. New Jersey's actually a really good state. I know people are going to you know call me a homer and stuff for that one, but New Jersey puts out a lot of talent. Like, they typically do. I mean, so there's a couple I, – I would say there's a couple states that are in that conversation. I mean, like Alabama's an evolving one as, spell, as well, but I would say that as far as the top four – Mm-hmm. I think that it's pretty safe to say that Texas, Florida, California, Georgia are pretty much considered like that's where yeah. the talent is. Yeah. Yeah. Funny here. Okay. So funny. Louisiana to a degree. David said in the chat. Yeah. I, Louisiana is a little bit more volatile in a year to year perspective, but like I'm talking about like the consistency over the last few years, those are probably the four in my, in my book. So Notre Dame expected Sean, I'm going to do quick math here. So yeah. So we're expecting of those four states. I remember I mentioned that there's going to be almost 120 players mm-hmm. offered on Sunday. I we expect 60 plus kids to come from those four states. 60 plus, which I did the math off the total number. Again, I'm not going to put the exact number out there. 54 percent of the 116, uh, 100, not 116, it's uh, close to 120 offers. Okay, 54 percent are coming from four states, Sean. Four states, 54%, over 60 offers from Georgia, Texas, Georgia, Texas, Florida, California. I don't know why. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't expect to be shocked by that, but I read that number and I'm like, that's wild, man, to think about that so much talent is isolated in just four states. That's a wild thing for me to think about, man. It really was. But that is, once again, the foundation that I believe this is what Marcus Freeman would have loved to do from the start. Yep. But the brand wasn't strong enough on a recruiting trail to go at it that hard in those those states. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, there was recognition, and this is why you do things like Pot of gold. This is to, to get the attention, to garner the attention, to bring eyes on Notre Dame. This is why you do that stuff. That some people say, "Oh, that's silly." Yeah, sometimes silly things work. That's what. Look at social media is full of silly things where people try to get attention every day, and for some reason it seems to work for a lot of people. That's why they're called influencers. That's why they make a lot of money as influencers. You know why? Because I, people they're drawn wanna- to that. I want to be an influencer when I grow up, Sean. It sounds great. You just you drive, up, drive up attention and you just get money for it, man. It's absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Must be nice. But no, absolutely. <laughs> this is, it's absolutely going along with what we pointed out. And I think it's something Marcus Freeman wanted to get to. And I think they've gotten to a point where the foundation of everything that's been laid, the retention of Chad Bowden and Dre Brown, his elevation yes. and Things continuing and adding to the analyst position at Notre Dame as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Getting coaching staff you want that fits the plan. Everything seems to be aligned now. And now they can go full force into these areas where, you know, where two years ago people were like, why aren't they going into these areas? Why aren't they getting kids in this area? That area. They're not scared. And, They're not scared and, anymore. <laughs> no. And they will go after one or two or maybe three guys. But we just talked about the state of California. It's low. They are. Man, full force going after the state of California this year. Why? Because they laid the groundwork. They built the foundation. They built the relationships with the schools and the coaches. And now there is a love and a respect there that is reciprocal where they feel like it can be fruitful now for them to go all in on these particular states in 2026. It's not something that you just do. There is a relationship and a connection that have to be built in order to get to that point. And it seems like the staff has already, or has finally gotten to that point. It's a great point, Sean. Absolutely great point. Because uh, so Notre Dame started laying down foundation as soon as Marcus Rube got here in the state of Texas. Okay. Started laying down that foundation. And now you're seeing it become a consistent thing. First two recruiting classes under Marcus Freeman, six players from the state of Texas. They had three, the previous five years combined. Right. And Mm -hmm. they would have had, well, Technically seven, if you count Logan Thomas, he played his senior year in Ohio. If you, you want, we can say seven in a two year span there between 2023 and 2024 would have been eight if they would have signed Peyton Bowen. Right. So they are hitting Texas hard. There's no doubt about it. 
Florida. We're seeing Florida in 2025 right now. Davion Dixon, Justin Thurman, Ivan Taylor, you were hitting Florida a lot harder than you once did. A spot that Notre Dame was not having success in. They were not doing well in the state of Florida. And I think 2025, they still have a chance to impact Florida. 2026, I think Florida's going to continue to be a big state for them. But the one that's interesting, Sean, is California, right? California. Notre Dame's had hits in California. Cooper Flanagan, Rico Flores. Like, they've had hits over the last couple of years in, Flor- in California as of getting some of their talent. It, Kingston Ville obviously, in 2024. Mm-hmm. But, Sean, the I expect of all the, the states I talked about, the four big ones, okay? The four big ones of California, Georgia, Florida, Texas. Expect on Sunday the most the most the highest number of players from a single state to be offered by Notre Dame expected to be California in yeah. 2026 this is the next one we've seen Texas be vital we've seen Florida be vital vital over the last couple of years Notre Dame has tried to get more traction in Georgia they've gotten a couple of kids out of Georgia the last couple of years but expect California to be very important in 2026 we already talked about the several wide receiver offers in 2026 we also talk about quarterback. Yeah, but Brandon, so so Brandon just said California has always been good to Notre Dame. With quality players, Brandon, I agree. But I'm talking about volume in 2026. I'm talking about Notre Dame going out and getting several players potentially out of California, not one to two or two to three. I'm saying that volume is going to be a mm-hmm. bit higher in California in 2026 is kind of where I'm coming from because we already have Multiple quarterbacks out of the state of California that have already been offered. Talking about Ryder Lions, Brady Smigel, Troy Hewn. We're also talking about wide receivers. Literally four of the five current offers, Notre Dame in 2026, are out of the state of California. You should expect the California number to rise on Sunday. And I think California is going to be vital, Sean, in 2026. It's going to be huge. And that's fantastic. Brandon pointed out the history with, and this is why. Remember when everything was happening, the super conferences were being formed and the transition and the, the dissolution of the Pac 12 and teams being added to the Big Ten. And everybody was like, Notre Dame should just move on from Stanford. And then Notre Dame should just, no, no. Newt Rockley knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. He was building a national recruiting database and landscape for Notre Dame as an independent. He knew he knew what Notre Dame was going to have to do to remain viable moving forward. And it still rings true today. Yeah. No, you give yourself a season ending game to highlight your team in California, which turns into a recruiting trip. Yes. You get there Friday. Your coaches get there early. They go out to the schools. They talk to the players. They talk to the coaches. You play the game. You win the game. You dominate. You look great. You come back home. You go to the playoffs. Notre Dame and the brand looks great to all of the kids, sophomores, juniors in the state of California. Movement. That is what you establish. So, no, you don't, I don't care if Stanford's no longer in the, is in the ACC now. No, you keep Stanford. You keep them on the schedule. They pay dividends. Well, they're not a good team. They go kick their butt and look good doing it. Go make yourself look good to the Cal- the elite California athletes. It's the same thing. USC is going to be, it's a big game. Look at USC is your rival. It's a big game. And if you beat USC in California, that's huge to those California kids because that's the program they look up to as they grow up in California. So everything, look, man, this is what, the season of alignment in a lot of different ways for Notre Dame with everything across the board from administration to coaching to recruiting to quarterback play to this team having this top 10 offense with the top. Everything literally could be, be aligning this year to be, wow, that we can point to Delbar to say that was the year in yep. all facets where Notre Dame went to the next level. Yep. Like bookmark this when they hoist the trophy, mm-hmm. bookmark that 24 year when the 26 pot of gold went out. Sure. <laughs> bookmark yeah. that year when everything seemed to be aligned and finally took off. Yeah. 
I, I just think California is going to be so interesting, Sean, because you hit on it a little bit there, right? It's that when we grew like not even when we grew up, like pretty recently, it was like, if you were a California kid, you're probably going to USC, right? Like you're mm-hmm. going to the, like that, right? Like Stanford had its, has had its presence when they were at their peak. UCLA had their presence at some points, right? Like, but right now, USC doesn't really recruit high school very well. UCLA is in a very tough transition. Mm-hmm. Washington is in a transition. They are always going to be a little bit of a threat in Cali. The we I had I I, I don't know if you uh, Sean like last week I had Max Torres who covers or um covers the Oregon Ducks on right uh, over at SI mm-hmm. and he told he talked about you know that n- right now Oregon has a huge presence in California like huge probably the biggest of any program out west and right now. Notre Dame has a chance to dip into the talent point of ca- talent pool of California because none of the California teams are recruiting at a very high level in the States. So uh-huh. you need to go there and beat Oregon more than anything. You need to beat Alabama going out to California for like the Peyton Woodyards of the world, right? Like that's the, I guess that's the, the competition that you have for Cali right now. But now that USC is not recruiting at a high level in the state, UCLA is down. Washington is going into a, a tough transition after Kalen the board left. Like you need to go out into Cali and get some dudes. And that, that's all me saying is that I think 2026. And mm-hmm. again, Brandon made a great point. Notre Dame has dipped into Cali and they've had success in Cali over the years historically. But I think that volume is what we're talking about. 2026. I wouldn't be shocked if you get five to six guys in 2026 out of the state of California. Like I think that that's possible, man, just kind of the early names that we're hearing out there. So I think 2026, California could be a huge state. Florida, I think, is going to be another big state. Yeah. You got to dip into Texas and get some talent there. Georgia, anytime you get into Georgia over the last few years, that would be great as well. The big dogs are big again in 2026, those huge states. And Notre Dame, I think, is going to have to be able to have an impact in those states in 2026. And remember what we said sometimes you have to be happy for the losses because there's a big picture to it in recruit, right? As devastating as losing Keon was, Keon committing and Keon speaking the way he did about Notre Dame opens the door to a Dallas goal, opens sure. the door to, to the other kids in 26. Yeah. It, it, it brings yeah. attention. Like you have, like, look, you, you lost Justin Scott, right? Yeah. Burgess is watching. These sure. 26 kids, we, we've been talking on a D-line. They're watching. Like, oh, snap, Notre Dame was in it. Like, they were the leader at one point. Like, you, yep. this is recruiting, man, especially when you're building. You can't be afraid to lose. And that's one thing I can say. Marcus Freeman has never been scared on the recruiting trail. And he knows that other things had to be developed within the foundation of the program to finally close the deal on certain guys. Yep. But hey, like what we're seeing now, the loss of a Peyton Bowen. Now in the 25 class, it's like, oh, now they're starting to get some of these big time safeties. Like, okay. And what's the next step in 26? Like, do they heck J- Jadon Blair is still on the table in 25? Like, if they get him, mm-hmm. you know, can you count that as you know a byproduct of being there at the finish line for a paid born and having eyes on Notre Dame and being part of the story of the debacle. Yeah. And even it though it didn't matters. go your way, it all matters. This is the yeah. minutia of college football recruiting. And I would love, I'm going to tell you something. If I would love to be in the room, mm-hmm. right? Like that's my dream. I would love to be a fly on the wall in draft board rooms the days before the NFL draft and like weeks before pot of gold. What, Sean, you already to know what it's like, where, man. Have you, have you not seen draft day? You know exactly what it's like. I say very <laughs> sarcastically. <laughs> oh my God. That the way it went in draft day it would never happen like that. No, no, that's not, that's, that's not, I love that movie because it's so ridiculous, but that's nothing what a what I do. A, I do believe there are some GMs in the National Football League that are football dumb, yes, intelligent, sure. intelligent individuals sure. with football dumb. So yeah. maybe you get one, but to get two, yes, yeah. no, 
No. No. You know, not, not you know quite, the funniest part? Ridiculous. Yeah. You know the funniest part? Mm -hmm. Is when he when he's asked by the GM, what's wrong with Bo? Yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with him? Yeah. Why's he dropping? Dude. What's wrong with yes. Bo? <laughs> if you have to ask that question on the day of, then you have an evaluation problem. <laughs> if, if, if and also someone wouldn't be asking a, another general manager like, "Hey, you got to level with me. What's wrong with Bo Callahan?" Like, <laughs> you don't ask another general manager that. like he's going to tell you the full truth of what he's thinking, right? Right. As, as he's, he's trying, trying to, to make it, as he's trying to make a trade with you, right? Like, yeah, that's not good. That's not. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. That <laughs> that absolutely would not happen. Yes, the movie is ridiculous. It's awesome though. I watch it every single year because it's hilarious and it's entertaining. But yes, draft day is is not at all what a draft room uh, war room is like. I agree hundred percent. Heck no. Heck no. Oh, Heck no. But Sean, a quick note that you made, and I think that it's it's hundred percent. Is I remember talking to Dallas Gold when he got first offer when he was a sophomore. I asked him, I was like, "Oh, has Keon been putting in work with you, like talking to you?" And he's like, "Yeah, man, he's been talking to me about Notre Dame all the time." So you're not wrong. You're absolutely not wrong in that sense. It obviously didn't work out with Keon, but did that make a great early impression on Dallas Golden? Yeah, absolutely did. And we still feel absolutely. great about where Notre Dame is with Dallas Golden. So, yep, feel really good about it. All right, Sean, a couple positions of strength and a couple that look like a little bit weaker. We talked about quarterback, right? Do we need to keep mm -hmm. going about quarterback? Quarterback in 2026 looks amazing. Looks dope. Yeah. I mean, what, like, again, if Notre Dame ended up with Ryder Lyons, the quarterback out of Folsom, or they ended up with Brady Smigel, the quarterback out of California, or they ended up with Noah Grubbs out of Florida or Brady Hart out of Florida, would I complain at all? Absolutely not. And I, I said it again, 2025, I thought it was a very good quarterback class, especially at the top. But there were a couple kids that were on the board for Notre Dame where I would have been like, eh, a little disappointed if that's who they end up with. Like, like a little bit. Like Cutter Bowley is the guy. Like, I'm like, he ended up he ended up reclassifying the 2024, so it didn't even matter. But like every year there was one or two guys on the board potentially that you're like, eh, I don't know if I'd be like jacked about that one. Like, I don't know if yeah. that would do it for me. 2026, there's really not a guy on the board right now that I'd be like, oh man, I don't like that. I don't, I don't see it with that kid. Like, they're all different, right, Sean? The great thing is Ryder Lions is much more of the out of structure athlete type of dude. Mm -hmm. Brady uh Smigel is more of the in the pocket type of dude. Noah Grubbs is in the same mold of a Brady Smigel, more of an in the pocket dude. Brady Hart's got kind of, he's a pocket kid, but he's got a little bit of that like, like sway to him as far as being able to move out of the pocket and such, right? Like he's got a little bit more of that. Will Griffin, who has been offered by Notre Dame early out of, out of Tampa Jesuits, more of the dual threat ish, sort of like a Ryder Lion. So you have a really different mix of quarterbacks. There's not, it's not like a one size fits all. You have different types, which I think makes the conversation pretty interesting. It goes back to I just love people that want to do their job. Double R. That's it. As a coach, you get paid millions to teach and develop. As here we, we have a nation full of our most important teachers and de developers that don't get paid. They are grossly underpaid. I literally made a, a career change partly because of that. Yes. Yep. And then we come to sports and the guys that get paid millions to teach and develop don't want to do the job. Right, right. <laughs> they, they get lazy with the job. Like if you're not this type of kid, I you know, I don't want you. Coach, <laughs> it's your job to make them better. Yep. It it is amazing. And I love the fact that what we're seeing in recruiting, these all the quarterbacks are totally different. Yes. Have different traits. Yep. But yet and still, it's like, yo, I can I can work with that. That's the, that's the, what Dan Brock and, and Gadulia are saying. I can work with mm -hmm. that. I can work with that. You, you know what's hilarious, Sean, is they're all different, you know, different body types, different play styles, but they're all from California or Florida. Right? <laughs> it's like that's that's where it is, right? It's it's yeah. I, I mean, yeah. So 
quarterback board is nutty in 2025. I literally wrote that on the rundown. I said quarterback class is nutty, word for word. It's a mm-hmm. nutty class in 2026. Running back class, Sean, too. Again, we can't talk about too many of these guys because several will be added to the board in, uh, in on Sunday. Jonas Walton is the only one that's on the board right now for Notre Dame, who's a very talented player in his own right. But running back class, compared especially to 2025, which I thought was an okay running back class, I think mm-hmm. 2026 has a lot of good running backs, man. So expect running backs to be a very interesting board. And I would say this, of the two weaker classes that I've seen so far, and again, this will change as I watch more players, as I get a little bit deeper, as they develop going into their junior year and afterwards. But I thought linebacker class and offensive line class looks a little bit, eh, it's okay. It's a little it, bit down in my opinion. Double R, because we talked about Notre Dame is independence and how it impacts every area, right? And right. how they have to start early in recruiting. I'm th- the new the nuance of that, right? Yes. There are certain positions within mm-hmm. Notre Dame where they can make an impact with a later offer on a kid. Like if you offer an offensive lineman, if, if a Notre Dame offer go- comes to a young man as an offensive lineman, it does, whatever it comes, it hits. Yes. It makes an impact. <laughs> like, like, whoa, I got offered yeah. by Notre Dame as an offensive lineman? Right, exactly. Absolutely. Yep. It hits. Yep. And so that just that's, that's the nuance of it. Like there are certain positions still within the program where I don't want to say slow walk it, but yeah. they can afford. And I think now the running back position at Notre Dame could quite possibly become a position where if they like a kid early, they can offer the kid, get on the kid. But, mm-hmm. you know, Dino McCullough is audacious, man. He mm-hmm. really is. Like, you know, you talked about, I don't know if there's a realistic chance, but, I mean, heck, James Simon still has them in his top six, eight, whatever's. Right. You know, and that was, that was <laughs> yeah, yeah Dylan yeah. jumped in that fray a little bit later. Than most people, but that running back offer from Notre Dame is starting to become like, oh snap! Yep, I got a running back offer from Notre Dame, yeah. and it's, well, it's it's interesting watching that the nuance of Notre Dame jumping out early, but still in certain positions being able to kind of like be a little bit more delayed mm-hmm. in their approach, and then be audacious to say, you know what? Let's see what's up with this kid. We already got two kids in the class, but let you know. Let's let's just see. Let's just see. Yeah. I the greatest example I think last year, Sean, was David Sanders was never going to come to Notre Dame, the 2025 kid. But mm-hmm. you know what what offer he wanted from the beginning that he was petitioning for was Notre Dame because it matters, right? Like that that mm-hmm. offer matters to offensive linemen. Brandon said tight end as well as a as a position where it's like that matters and for sure, 100 percent I mean. I think that a lot of what the past tight ends, including Michael Mayer, did at Notre Dame is like that's that resonates with kids, right? So I, I mm-hmm. think that tight end was another one. Tight end is also a good mention, Brandon, because I think 2026 tight end class is it's pretty good, man. It's pretty good. Again, not dropping names, but just telling you, expect some very talented tight ends offered on the board. Expect some very talented running backs, quarterbacks, good year. Defensive line looks pretty good early on as well. Again, I, mm-hmm. I thought the – I thought the offensive line, at least from what I've seen, eh, hit or miss for me, right? I, I I think that linebacker was another one that I was kind of like, eh, I don't know, maybe not the best one overall, but early that, early on, yeah. what you say is more interior O line than tackle O line in twenty six, or is well, it just co- off the board? I, I would say it's kind of across the board. Now, don't get me wrong about this, though. There was a couple studs up top. We'll talk about one on Monday specifically that mm-hmm. is one of the best offensive line prospects I've ever seen. On yeah, the you told me that early. He's, he's yeah. A, well, yeah, I, I guess I shouldn't say his name because yeah. he might be a part yeah. of the event. But, like, right. you, got, you guys can do some research and probably figure out who I'm talking about. But absolute freak show, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Those are some of the notes. So, Sean, 2026, anything to add? Or are we almost ready to get out of here? No. 26 class is a continuation of what we think could possibly be the best class that Marcus Freeman has assembled at Notre Dame in the 25 class. And yep. like we said, they're finally going full force into the top four areas, you know, where you get the best recruits on a consistent basis, which is Florida, mm-hmm. Georgia, Texas, and California. You're seeing the mass offers and the mass connections 
that are being established. I think that the, one of the things that was kind of a precursor to that was that extended yep. trip they took out to California during the open period as a staff. Like that was very, very important. And so that's when they got to see a Ryder Lions up close and personal, a right. Brady Smigel up close and personal. And so right. just small things like that lead to what we're going to be able to see, you know, in these offers coming up on Saturday, on Sunday, I'm sorry. Well, and I think a thing we forgot to mention, and we'll end it here, Sean, is that also I would even say something like getting Kingston Villiamo outside of St. John Bosco. Like what mm. ripple does that have on the St. John Bosco program that Notre Dame hasn't been able to get into? Is Notre Dame able to penetrate modern day coming into mm -hmm. the 2026 class? Like there's a lot of potential here. Again, abbreviated notes, rolling through it real quick for the people that just joined late. The big four, Georgia, Texas, Florida, and uh, Georgia uh, and California expect Notre Dame to extend a lot of offers to those kids. Over half of the offers we expect on Sunday to be from those four states specifically. A little bit of a smaller class uh, of offer list to the home state players. So a little bit of a smaller number of Illinois and Indiana kids. Quarterback class is nutty. I'm Ryan Roberts. That's Sean Davis. Again, folks, Monday, we will be back for Notre Dame recruiting hour because we're going to recap the weekend's festivities. Make sure you hit that like button for us. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Notification bell if you listen to us on YouTube. If you listen to us on your favorite podcast platform, five-star reviews are always very much appreciated. We appreciate you all so much, as always, for joining us on a live show. And we will talk to you again very soon here on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.